uh, our workshop on uh, scanner car inside. So, um, uh, so this, uh, I, I have the privilege of getting to introduce the workshop, although um, Josh and Jordan are here as well, and uh, Josh is going to, uh, I think, I'm supposed to get you excited, and then he's going to like bring you back <laughs> and then tell you why we need to all get together and talk about these things. Um, before we get going, uh, I wanted to um, thank uh, a few people. So our sponsors here, the Langfeld Fund from the Department of Psychology. Um, and then this, the genesis of this really comes from uh, the Next Generation Social Science Program at DARPA which supported some of our research uh, and some of the research that you'll hear about through the course of the workshop. Uh, and then uh, Casey, Carola, and uh, Beth have been working, we've been getting emails from some of these people. Um, Carola and Beth are out here getting things set up. And then the AV team here in the Department of Psychology has done a great job getting things sorted out, and so we're webcasting and, and so on. Um, and so we really appreciate that. Okay, so the reason why we're all here is to think about, I think, how are we going to do psychology differently using the kinds of technologies that are becoming available to psychologists? So this is the first psychology lab. This is Wilhelm Wundt's lab. This is Wundt sitting right here. Oops, not working. All right. Uh, as an experimental participant, you can see how a psychology lab works, right? You have a bunch of people standing around while someone is doing a task. In this case, he's doing a task using some brass instruments. If you, if you walk into a psychology lab today, it looks essentially the same. Uh, <laughs> just in town hall here, uh, and so you know the, the the basic kinds of methods that we're used to using in psychology have not really changed in the hundred or so years since psychologists have been trying to answer questions about the mind. So one change that's starting to happen is using services like uh, crowdsourcing services like Amazon Behind the Turf or what used to be called uh, Crowdflower, or now we have a variety of other kinds of services like prolific academic and so on, as services that are used to recruit participants and to run experiments online. And that's something which has increased the number of participants that we have in our studies, that's increased the speed at which we can do studies. But I think one of the big questions that we want to engage with here is a question about whether we should be doing things differently as a consequence of having access to those resources. And so one way of framing that question is to ask, you know, should you run the same experiment online with 1,000 participants, you run the lab with 100? Or maybe you know, when you have 10,000 participants or 100,000 participants or some of the things you're going to hear about are in places where we have a million participants or 10 million participants. And how does that change the way that you should think about trying to do the research that you're doing and the kinds of methods that we're going to use for doing that research? Uh, so, um, uh, Marx said, you know, uh, our favorite cognitive scientist, um, uh, you know, nearly quantitative differences beyond a certain point pass into qualitative changes. And I think that's the point that we want to explore, is you know, what happens as that quantitative change becomes a qualitative change in the way that we do our science. And so consistent with this perhaps Marxist perspective, I'm going to present to you a sort of brief manifesto. I've written a manifesto about these things. Uh, and the, the the, the real theme here is the idea that more data is different data, right? It's not, it's not the same thing when you start to get more data. Um, and I think there are three sort of points here in this manifesto. So first, we should be collecting more data. Second, we should be running different kinds of experiments since we can get more data. And third, we should be analyzing the results of those experiments differently. Um, and these correspond sort of loosely to the themes that we're going to be exploring in the workshop over the next three days. So, the first of these points about collecting more data is really uh, that we're not realizing the potential that comes from these kinds of technologies. So, you know, I talked about crowdsourcing. There are other, you'll hear about other methods that people use to recruit participants that are, uh, can re result in even larger samples. Uh, but these methods of internet recruitment are basically a, a more efficient machine for turning dollars into data, right? You could always turn dollars into data. You could call up you know, a polling company and have that polling company go out and collect data for you, or you could bring people into the lab, except that's kind of limited by how many people you can draw in. These kind of technologies turn those processes into things that are far cheaper and more efficient and more easily scalable. And I think that's something where just the fact that it's possible to do that is something that then changes how easy it is to uh, collect data and changes a bunch of equations about the way that we do science. 
And I think our science hasn't adapted to recognize the changes that that implies. So, you know, uh, if you don't have enough data, then that means you're going to spend more time messing around trying to figure things out. Right? If you kind of look at skeptically at the history of psychology, one way of looking at that is that what we do is you run a study, we're like, well, here are some conclusions we could draw from this. Somebody else is going to run another study that said, here are some conclusions that we can draw, and sort of incrementally builds on itself. But if you had just at the start, you know, collected a whole lot of data such that there weren't those residual questions, then you would have saved all of those people who came after you trying to figure out the consequences of the the uh, the, the limited amounts of data that you had. So you know, if we instead of spending you know, when we write a grant, 1% of our budget on data collection made that 10%, and we're able to collect large definitive data sets initially, such that we were able to actually definitively answer the questions that we were setting out with in our research, then that would mean that nobody else had to go and write those papers where they're trying to figure out what the next insight is that, that follows in that chain. And so, you know, this is a, a real, uh, there's, a, there's a real cost that's associated with not getting enough data, which is, you know, you're first of all not saving money. So if you're not collecting enough data to be able to answer your question, and somebody else has to collect more data to answer that question, that person is investing time into doing that. That time is also costing dollars in the form of the salaries of all the people involved in doing the research, and it's costing human lives in the sense of, you know, the lives of the researchers who are spending their time trying to answer those questions that maybe you could have answered definitively if you just collected more data to start with. And so, there's a different kind of financial model for doing our research where we think about investing more money into collecting data so that we're saving more money in terms of these other kinds of resources. And so I think part of this is that there's a, a convention that we have about what the natural scale of a psychology experiment is. Where we think about trying to answer a simple binary question about you know, what's going on inside people's heads in a way that you know, only requires us to collect a certain amount of data to do that, some number of participants or something like that. And I think there's a, a, a change that we can make in the conventions that we have around what the sort of norms are around collecting behavioral data. Um, so if you're having trouble justifying to yourself why you should be, you know, why it's okay to spend lots of money collecting big data sets, and we'll see some, some studies through this workshop that you've done that. Uh, one thing that you can do that might help you with this is you can pretend that you're a cognitive neuroscientist, right? So if you're a cognitive neuroscientist, you know that collecting your data set is going to cost a lot of money, right? Because you have to pay for scanner time. Scanner time is expensive. Uh, I don't know, what, what does scanner time cost nowadays? Like, like $600 an hour is kind of like the number that I have in my head. Is that a little less? A little less. Um, <laughs> so, you know, so I sort of, you, know, you, you can ask the question, of if you're writing a grant as a cognitive neuroscientist, you know that you're going to have to put 10% of that grant towards data collection because your data is expensive. But you can think about collecting behavioral data in the same way, where what we want to do is you know, collect enough data to answer our questions, and maybe that requires spending an equivalent amount of money. Like, if you can ask yourself, will you get more insight from one hour of standard time or 100 hours of token time? There's roughly sort of equivalent quantities monetarily. And I think we're not doing ourselves and our science justice by underestimating the amounts of money that we should be spending on those kinds of data collection projects. Okay, so the second point here is we should be running different kinds of experiments because we can get more data. Uh, and really, the idea here is to think about how you can use those large data sets to do your science differently. So Alan Newell had a famous critique of psychology as trying to ask 20 questions, uh, like play a game of 20 questions with nature, right? Where you're, like, you have something you want to answer, and you go off and you sort of say, well, is it this or that? And you get an answer to that binary question. You say, well, is it this or that? And you get another answer to that binary question. And so you design this series of experiments that gets you to that point. But at the end of the day, what you've done is just get, you know, however many bits back from your investigation of these kinds of questions. And I think we can think about designing studies that give us more bits that aren't framed in terms of binary questions about whether it's one thing or another. Um, and so we can think about you know, other kinds of designs that we can use for large-scale experiments. And again, you're going to see examples of these kinds of things over the course of the next couple of days. So one is, uh, a lot of the time when we do experiments, we scientists think very carefully about the exact contrast that we want to run. We're going to compare these two conditions because those two conditions are the thing that's going to give us insight into is it this theory or that theory. Except by doing that, what you're doing is essentially doing a random walk in the space of experiments. 
where if you imagine there's a space of all possible experiments corresponding to the parameters you could set up for those experiments, you're saying, I'm going to test this point, and then I'm going to test this point, and then based on the results that I get from that, I'll test this point. And by doing that, you're sort of sampling that space in a way which is guided by theory and then may not reveal actually what's really going on in terms of the behavior and give you a good data set that you can use for actually evaluating different kinds of models or theories. And so one kind of you know, large-scale experiment you run is one where you say, well, I'm not going to let my theory a priori drive the conditions that I'm going to run. I'm going to run a whole bunch of theory, uh, conditions that are generated procedurally. I'm going to define an algorithm that's going to generate those conditions. And I'll show you an experiment like that later today. Um, you can run experiments with more complex naturalistic stimuli. Right? One of the things that we're used to doing as psychologists is boiling things down to the simplest possible stimuli so that we can study those in the lab. But part of the reason why we do that is because we get relatively few bits back from people. If you're getting more bits back, then you can use some of those bits to be able to work with more complex and more challenging kinds of stimuli. And I'll talk about experiments along those lines too. Um, you can run what we call massively multifactorial experiments. Right? There are a lot of domains of psychology where people have nine different theories about why it is a particular behavior happens. You can run one experiment where you test all of those theories simultaneously. Um, and you can do things like, instead of asking, you know, is this higher than that, or does this increase this rather than that, those sort of binary questions. You can use dense sampling of a space of values to allow you to actually estimate the form of entire functions, something which is a different approach from you know, asking these kinds of binary questions. So I think the bigger picture slogan here is that we can start to think about much more complex kinds of designs and ways of uh, being able to, to, to probe the space of possible experiments. And so one of the slogans that we use for thinking about this is experiment design becomes algorithm design, right? That we use the kinds of tools that we're used to using as computer scientists for thinking about how to design automated systems for discovering the structure of something or how to get the most bits from a set of queries. And that becomes the problem that we're trying to solve when we're trying to build the experiments we're going to build. OK. And then the third point is we should be analyzing the results of these experiments differently. Uh, and I think there are lots of ways of thinking about this. Uh, I mean, one of them is just clearly, for lots of reasons, like using our sort of traditional statistical psychology methods of, of looking for statistically significant t-tests is not, not a good idea. Um, uh, so in particular, uh, so one reason is just because when you have lots of data, that, that's not a reasonable criterion. But another reason is that a lot of the time, those kinds of tests are really formulated to allow you to do things where you're contrasting uh, very simple kinds of hypotheses. And so if we're asking much richer questions and we're collecting much richer kinds of data, then we need to have richer kinds of models of uh, what's going on. And so a lot of the kinds of analysis techniques that we're going to use are things that maybe have to use ideas that come from modeling. But I think the bigger and, and deeper point here is that as we get more data, often what that reveals is something about the complexity of human behavior. Uh, so we're, I think the, the cynical view of this is that psychologists have been lucky to have had only small amounts of data in the past because that allowed us to get away with having really simple theories, right? If you were getting back a few bits at a time, you're, you're getting back a, a little bit of insight into what's going on, then the only kind of theory that you can support is a theory that's a simple theory, a theory that you know, involves only a few factors or something that's easy to express. And so, I think that creates the illusion that we're going to be able to come up with simple explanations for human behavior in general. And I think what happens is you start to get more data is that you can start to justify more complex models and you start to realize that a lot of the variation that's evident in those data is variation that comes from uh, real sort of complex systematic stuff that's just not being something that we're able to detect, to detect using the kinds of methods that we're used to using. And so, one of the big challenges that I see here is the challenge of thinking about how is it as scientists we're able to work with theories that have a complexity which is you know, equivalent to the complexity of the data that we're, we're dealing with. That we start to deal with problems where you know, simple stories are not the best stories and we need to build new kinds of tools and new mechanisms for making theories and new ways of expressing those theories that allow us to get insight into what's going on in those data uh, but do justice to its complexity. And so this might be things where we need to use ideas from data science and machine learning 
to help us humans understand some of the things that might be challenging for humans to understand about human behavior. Okay, so that's my manifesto. Everybody amped up? <laughs> yeah. Okay, Josh, you want to take over? I just think it's scary. It all sounds really hard. It's not as hard as stream of being able to collect data from many subjects worldwide, um, many items, many context manipulations, et cetera, et cetera, or we live in the dream. Um, So I wasn't a graduate student yet, um, but I was at a talk um, on, I want to say it was a talk about um, the McGurk effect or something like that. But uh, the speaker um, did not mention this uh, really, but it was on his slide. There was like a you know, top right corner, you know, N equals, it was a little over a thousand. Like, Holy crap. How do you get a thousand subjects? Like, oh, well, I was running it online. How long did that take? It's like, oh, uh, about, about a week. Um, uh, so it happened that his advisor had just like written a book um, that was getting a lot of press, and so there was a lot of traffic to the lab website, and so there were like a thousand subjects in this McGurk effect study. Um, I remember thinking then, wow, what would I do with a thousand subjects? And I was pretty sure that it was going to be something different from what I was doing. Um, I wasn't quite sure what yet. Um, and what's interesting about this is 2006 now seems like a long time ago. It's actually not um, in the following. So here is when the World Wide Web was established. This is the oldest online study that I can find. Um, there's a nice quote here from the paper. 
Uh, so this was, you know, this is actually on a, I believe, electronic mail service. They didn't have the term email yet. Um, at a large company, maybe GE. Uh, in the study report in this paper, EMS, electronic mail service, was clearly used for the preferred data collection method because it produced adequate data, response rates, and willingness for further participation with little expenditure, researcher time, or effort, and a high degree of convenience for responders. 1986. Um, so, <coughs> by 2000, the WebEx list had been, um, had been established as the oldest online compendium of online experiments that I know about. Um, by 2006, I believe, 27% of APA journals had published online studies. Um, and I just want to point out that that's when Amazon Mechanical Turk was, uh, was um, invented, published, I don't know, founded. Uh, so this is not a new thing by any means. Um, when you look at uh, some of the large, you know, more established online laboratories, um, the oldest one I know of is out of service. Probably complicitly a representative from is uh, the oldest continuously operating one, um, and then a few others that have collected a lot of data. Here are some of the largest studies that I know of. Um, you know, so we have hundreds of thousands of subjects going back, you know, studies for you know almost 15 years at this point. And they can be used for lots of things. So. Here are, they really revolutionized the study of lifespan and development. Um, it turns out all kinds of crazy things are happening in adulthood in terms of development and aging and, uh, and whatnot that we had like absolutely no idea. All the theories have basically fallen apart. There aren't new ones yet, um, but there's a whole lot of new data coming out all the time. Um, there's lots of really interesting work looking at different demographic effects. So if you're wondering, do people have, uh, if you do like big five personality tests of people all around America, uh, do certain cities have different personalities? The answer is not really, but um, anyway. Uh, this is actually, <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones here. This is from a friend of mine, uh, Katerina Reniki, um, was interested in website design and just looking at um, what do different people think is a pretty website. And there was actually a demographic category, I forget which one it was, uh, that, thought, that thought in her days that this was the most beautiful, elegant um, website. Um, which, uh, so she's uh, you know, interested in web website design. This is something that she had found. Um, so in person, trying to do web development in Africa, and they kept on trying, they hated like the like bare white display, like Googled style displays that, um, um, that uh, middle class Americans love. Anyway, this was, like a, this was like hundreds of thousands of people around the world reading these websites. Um, here's a really cool one. This is a data set of 40 countries um, comparing um, gender differences in cognitive control performance against gender differences in workplace uh, participation and actually seen like a clear relationship across countries. Um, uh, I forgot what the, the result was, but there is a result. Um, in terms of, I think, more unequal workplace, uh, I think, if I remember right, the countries with more unequal, with less female participation in the workforce also had um, uh, larger uh, male bias sex differences in cognitive control. Um, other things we can do is test lots and lots of stimuli. So people have been interested in forever, how many words does somebody know? Um, well, the, part of the problem is like you can, I, if we just want to this experiment with somebody here, um, like I can start asking Jordan, do you know this word, do you know that word? Uh, and at a certain point, Jordan's going to get up and walk away and long before we run out of words to ask him about. Um, but by spreading uh, 61,800 words across 221,268 subjects, they were able to estimate um, roughly how many English words people know. And if you want to know, uh, you should find the study, because I don't remember. Um, it, was, it was a cool result. Um, there's also, we'll be seeing more of this sort of stuff. Um, this is not so much like treating online participants as subjects, but as sort of um, uh, volunteer uh, researchers uh, helping us in the data pipeline. There's been a lot of, you know, some cool projects doing that sort of thing too. Um, probably, um, so I actually put up uh, his non cognitive science one, but it's universe, uh, but we'll be hearing, hearing about universe later today. Um, iWire, if you've ever seen it, is the closest one that I, so like these like 3D maps of neurons or something that are actually getting online participants to help build. Um, and that's just web based studies. That's not counting anything that you might be doing with game consoles or um, wearables or phones or whatnot, all kinds of cool stuff that you can do. Um, which raises an interesting question. If massive online experiments are transformative and have been possible for 30 years, why aren't there more of them? 
I mean, why, like, why is anybody doing anything else anymore? Um, so, I don't actually know, but uh, I think I know. Um, it's almost as good. Uh, which is, uh, we have, uh, basically, we're working against 150 plus years of scientific culture. Um, so our methods, so I think as um, you know, Tom was saying, I'm going to try to flush out, our methods, paradigms, analyses, equipment, questions, are optimized for in-lab studies of 25 undergraduates. Right, when you think about like, you know, what do we even just, uh, thinking about like, yeah, in our training institutions are designed to support these studies. Think about what we teach students in um, statistical, like in our stats classes, teach them about t-tests. T-tests are basically only useful if you're running studies with 25 undergraduates. And these like large um, data sets is just, you would never even have invented t-tests. What are they for? Um, yeah, so this is, so more, uh, more history. Let's think about like, even like why things are like this. So this is also from, um, this is actually from uh, Harvard's uh, psychology lab um, back when it was founded. This is a bunch of uh, materials for doing auditory experiments. Here's visual experiments. And, um, and as Tom pointed out, this is how we do auditory and visual experiments for the most part now. Now, a big difference between this equipment and this equipment is just here is show of hands. How many people have, like, roughly, let's say, half of that stuff lying around in your own home? How many people have one of these? Not specifically a Mac, but like a computer or some sort. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, so we actually, there's, it's not that, you know, the like founders of psychology got into a room and thought about, you know, what would be the perfect way of doing psychology? Let's study a small group of undergraduates. It's a matter of, they had a, you know, equipment that they needed to collect their measurements. That equipment was not something that, you know, people just had lying around and you need to bring people into the laboratory. If you're bringing people into a laboratory, where's the laboratory? Did, you know, counterfactual world it might have been different, but in our world, these laboratories tend to be on university campuses. And undergraduates are just who happens to be around and available for experiments, and there's like a limited number of them, and so we study small numbers of undergraduates. Um, but, and this, again, because our statistical methods are um, sort of really developed for studying, for uh, analyzing these kinds of studies, and also the kinds of questions that we even think of asking. <laughs> Um, are really, you know, in some sense reverse engineered from what the kinds of data we can get. And I think this becomes increasingly, I can't prove that to you, but I think it becomes increasingly clear the more you think about what kinds of studies you could be doing online and realize that there's entire important questions that are just not being studied, that actually you probably were reasons that you got into this field to begin with and have forgotten that you're not studying those questions because um, you couldn't. Um, so I'm not saying that, anyway, so the important thing is, you know, I'll, so we still have studies, of course, that we do have to bring people in the laboratory for. Like, if you want to do an fMRI study, that, it turns out, this is true, you can look it up, people do not have fMRI machines. <laughs> um, but they do have laptops, they have eye trackers, it turns out, because you can do pretty decent eye tracking from that little um, uh, webcam you can see on the top there. Um, you can do all kinds of things that we don't do in the laboratory, like um, using wearables. Um, et cetera. Um, so, uh, so I'm not saying that you can't do, um, there's nothing that you can do online, uh, like in the laboratory you can't do online, but I think if we were sitting down right now to imagine how do we want to do psychology, I think we would come to the realization that probably the vast majority of stuff that we want to do we don't need a physical laboratory for, um, or in fact can't even do in a physical laboratory. So um, workshop goals. Um, Really, like, I think like the core one here is to build that culture, right? So um, I'm definitely, like, I hope, you know, what I just said, uh, what I just said was not intended to come across as, uh, you know, I have all this knowledge and now I'm imparting it to you. Uh, it's, like, I struggle with this too. I'm constantly trying to figure out how to design studies because really stuck with, like, thinking about things like, oh, well, like, how am I going to do a, I just, well, we're going to have a demo on how to do lexical decision studies online later, so maybe I won't use that example. How are we going to do a McGurk effect study online? And that's a question of, well, do we actually want to do a McGurk effect study online? Maybe there's a different study that would be better to do, but we're used to thinking about certain kinds of studies and questions. Um, so one thing that we really want to do is get a bunch of people who are already really invested in doing online studies together to try to like, um, share what we've learned um, and, uh, and share technology, share advice. Um, and we thought if we were doing that, we might as well invite you know, other people too who are interested in doing these kinds of studies 
um, uh, to come and learn more. Um, so here's how the workshop's going to work. Today one, that's today, uh, is really focused on what can be done online. Um, so how do you address the questions that you're already interested in? Like how would you take the kinds of questions you're working on and convert that into a massive online study? Um, but also, you know, how do you even think of, you know, what are maybe some new questions that would be maybe even more interesting and more profitable uh, to be working on? Um, and I don't, when I say new questions, I don't mean like, you know, I'm a language person, now I'm going to study vision or something like that. I just mean, you know, stuff that's, you know, sort of very close to what you're working on. They actually do care about, um, but just haven't been because you didn't know how to do it. Um, also, we're going to be talking about how to recruit subjects. So, um, Tom talked about, of course, the, the, pay, the online labor markets, like Amazon Mechanical Turk. So that's, I think, familiar to people because it's not that different from what we do in the laboratory where we pay or in some other manner coerce students into doing our studies. Um, that actually turns out to have a few limitations, one of which is um, you generally don't uh, get great data, and that's true in the laboratory, too. Um, people have actually looked at what percentage of your subjects are doing anything other than pressing keys randomly. It's, not as large of a percentage as you would like, um, and that tends to be even worse on, say, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, uh, but the other thing is the online labor market is actually not that large, so you tap out at around 10,000 subjects. Um, if you want to study with a million subjects, it just turns out there's not a million people who, even if you could pay all of them $5 uh, for doing your study, actually feel like how many people here are actually motivated enough by $5 to do a study? Yeah, so that's the, well, a few people. Yeah, depends on the study. Um, generally, getting large amounts of subjects uh, requires um, finding some other way of motivating them to participate. So, that's, and um, so this morning we're going to have a bunch of examples of sort of cool, massive uh, data sets people work with. Not all of them were collected online, um, but we wanted uh, to get people thinking about sort of the, the kinds of things you might do with a lot of data. Um, we will have a the world's smallest poster session during lunch. Uh, there will be more <laughs> examples. Um, we just wanted to give you as many examples as we could uh, to take a look at. Um, day two, we're going to focus on this another problem, which is, so now I've got, da I've got data, so now what? Um, so this has been, um, okay, great. Uh, so just to give like one, very specific examples. So uh, one of the very first things people started getting with these massive online data sets are these like lifespan curves, right? Just normally we only test undergraduates, but if you're testing study online, you get like 10,000 subjects. Turns out they're like ages like seven to 80. The obvious thing to do is plot a graph, right? Uh, and that's really cool and you look at it and you're like, okay, now what do I say? where's the p-value? Um, if you look at the original papers that were published, um, there would be like a couple different curves for different like tasks, and they'd be like, that curve looks different from that curve. And that was literally the analysis. So it was like no p-values or anything, uh, any sort of differential statistics. It's just like, I don't know, they look different. Because um, uh, none of these curves are parametric. It's not really obvious how to analyze them or even what it is, you know, what you should analyze about them. It's for me some obvious things like, well, could I tell if the two curves are different? That turns out if they're not parametric, very hard to answer. Um, so I've got... Um, I think the first person who managed to come up with like an answer to this was Laura Germain and her colleagues in a 2009 paper, I mean 2010 paper. Laura and I collaborated on a later paper in which we improved that analysis. I've since come to, by the way, don't use that analysis because I've since come to believe that I have a lot of problems with it. Um, because we are not building on 150 years of statistical foundation. Um, I think I've got a new method uh, that works better. Um, but this is something that people run into a lot as soon as you realize that we just we have we don't have the statistical analysis methods uh, that uh, that can really like answer the questions we now are able to ask when we have the data. So again, morning we're gonna have some examples. Afternoon we're gonna have some training sessions. We can choose one, um, and then more practice. And by practice here, I mean um, uh, everybody's gonna get some hands on. Like here's like a kind of study someone might want to run or an actual data set. How are we supposed to analyze this? Um, and again, I, with these like practices, it's not that we necessarily think that anyone's going to like answer this. It's more that we want you to, um, you know, well, hopefully people come up with awesome I, I, you know, answers, which would be great. Um, but what we want people to do is start, um, you know, really like thinking about this. Um, <clears throat> day three, you may be thinking, well, I didn't take classes in web development in grad school. Um, should have signed up for those. They were probably really good. Um, 
there weren't any. Uh, so how are you going to do massive online studies? Um, so this is a problem that people have been trying to answer for a long time. Uh, there's been a lot of attempts to build tools for doing online studies. I think we're starting to have some uh, better ones. Um, and, uh, and we're going to have uh, some, some just described to you, but also some like hands-on tutorials so you can try to learn the basics of some of these um, platforms that are out there. And um, yes, it's mostly just little reviews and tutorials. And we have one minute for questions, and then we have a 15 minute coffee break. Everybody wants coffee. Great. All right. Then we'll be back here in 15 minutes. And this time we'll actually start on time. We figured nobody was actually here. I actually started a little bit late earlier, but we're starting right at time. Um, just speakers, can you stop putting your slides in the Google Drive? Yes. That'll make it so the things go more smoothly when we got the next up. Oh, no, I'm not going to say it. 
pretty formal. He made a bold flag. Tim Thomas flag. It's right by the door. And it says, um, uh, this room is donated by the H. And it says D.H. and Green Hall. B-R-O-U-D-H. And it looks very formal, like it out. I think that would actually kind of I think I'm going to I won't be I won't Anyway, yeah, so, so we will do something to put some focus on, on, on I think that like if we could get a little difference is that uh, it's just funny because our house is so quiet. Like the last week and then we did Well, they just came from there. Well, they're they're coming here for the effects. I don't think they. My mom was saying that. Well, that could be something for you to try that. But if you're trying to help out, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, parents or contact, yeah, maybe yeah. 10 milliseconds of that is the computer and the rest is. Because, like, what you really worry about is, right. like, it's 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 like, yeah. My friend says comes with age. Um, but pop out during the medical break. I will. All right. Okay. Room. Or ten ten points. Oh look. We just we heard a long story. Oh, you can't throw away your stuff. Your cat. Very important. So when there's like, you know, training on which there's correct answers, yeah. you make it a correct button, it can give you like a very long <laughs> And you can't go on until it's done. Oh, okay, okay. People learn quickly oh, that if their goal is to get out of an experiment as quickly as possible, yeah. it's better to like, do it correctly. Yeah, Ooh, that's a good one. I'm just trying to... <clears throat> We're trying to align their incentives with the incentives. Their incentive is they want to get on as quickly as possible. 
But again, the thing that got credit faster, so you just make it so that like, um, not taking the study seriously is not a good strategy.